The message this morning is intended as an introduction to and re overview of salvation. Now, this is something that all of us have given a lot of thought to, but hopefully this study will at least in part bring to life the reality of the salvation offered to us. For most of you, as I say, you've already given a lot of thought to it. It's nothing new. However, I hope it is at least a worthwhile reminder of what the second person of the Godhead was incarnated, suffered and died to provide for us. I'll be speaking this morning uh, almost entirely from the New King James and it's not a version I use at all at home. So if I stumble over the wording, please forgive me. The Bible teaches that mankind is inherently sinful, having a predisposition to sin. The outworking of this is evidenced daily through news programs. As my wife pointed out to me the other day, the conduct of many drivers on Australian roads and even in the selfish and rebellious nature of children you see in supermarkets. The whole society is increasingly suffering the consequences of generations of parents since World War II disregarding God's instructions regarding child rearing. The universal need for deliverance from the guilt, penalty and power of sin is clearly taught. And the Bible also points out that every one of us will eventually be called to account for what we have done in the body, whether good or evil. As Hebrews 9.27 states, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. The Bible also speaks of the origin of sin, sickness and death. God had created the first human beings, Adam and Eve, in innocence and placed them in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and keep it, as has been stated already. At that time, God said of his creation that was very good. Genesis 1.31 and God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. However, as Carl has also pointed out this morning, Adam and Eve sinned against God, and the result was the corruption of the entire creation. At Romans 5.12 Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. But listen to Romans 8, 21, 20, sorry, 8, Romans 8, verses 20 and 21. For the creation was subjected to food, Utility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, in hope because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. I think it's a bit clearer in the CJV. For the creation was made subject to frustration, not willingly, but because of the one who subjected it. But it was given a reliable hope that it too would be set free from its bondage to decay and would enjoy the freedom accompanying the glory that God's children will have. It's something a little surprising to me to think that the entire creation was subject to corruption. I realise we see it daily, but 
the sin of Adam and Eve was that profound. Following the fall, but prior to the death of Christ, no human being could be spiritually reborn. Every human being was spiritually dead from the fall until after the resurrection the death of our Lord. However, those who died in faith during that time are part of the true remnant church to which believers living today belong. The visible church consists of two components. The true remnant church and the harlot church. true remnant church will be ushered into the joy of their master but the members of the harlot church will hear that horrible comment be gone from me you who practiced iniquity since the fall God has established relationships with human beings by way of covenants which set out broad provisions. He left it up to his prophets to flesh out the details. The prophets who prophesied concerning the current dispensation longed for an understanding of what has been made available to us. Consider what the apostle wrote in 1 Peter 1 verses 10 to 12. 1 Peter 1 verses 10 to 12. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicated, indicating when he testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. King David begged God for what could only have been fulfilled by the new birth. He had committed grievous moral sins and had been made aware that he had primarily sinned against the holy God. He also recognised his underlying sin nature. Just going to read two passages out of Psalm 51. They're found in verses 4 and 10. Bearing in mind he had seduced Bathsheba and he had sent her husband off to his death, carrying the very instructions to his general to have him slain. Against you, you only, have I sinned. And then the cry of his heart, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. He received forgiveness of, all the, of the eternal consequences of his sin, but not of the temporal consequences. There is a man crying out for the new birth. And at that time it wasn't available. But then also bear in mind that to whom much is given shall much be required. The writer of the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, which in many Bibles is referred to as the faith chapter, wrote of selected Old Testament saints and summarised the outcome of their physical life experiences by saying, 
these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them. The mystery of the new birth was a mystery, or the reality of the new birth was a mystery hidden in God, but revealed initially by the Lord Jesus doing, during his earthly ministry and later elaborated on through the apostles under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Those who have received the Lord Jesus since his res resurrection now possess the reality of what the Old Testament saints longed for, the first fruits of the so great salvation provided by God through his grace. Consider the timely warning in Hebrews 2 verse 3. Hebrews 2 verse 3. We'll read down to it from verse 1. Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we ne neglect so great a salvation? <coughs> which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. A detailed study of salvation should start with an overview of the nature, character and attributes of God. The Bible pr provides a progressive revelation of those aspects commencing with the names by which he chose to reveal himself, then through his covenants and the revelations given to his prophets, culminating in the life and teaching of the Lord Jesus, was sub which was subsequently elaborated on through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the apostles. Look to John 14.26. The Lord was speaking at the time to spiritually dead men who had been with him for over three years but were hindered not only by the oral law that they'd been taught but also by their inability to spiritually discern truth. John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. John the Baptist and shortly thereafter the Lord Jesus, speaking to gatherings of people whose public school education had commenced at the age of five with a study of the first five books of the Bible, would both deliver messages summarised as repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. By way of comparison, the Apostle Paul, speaking to Gentiles in Athens, had to commence by speaking of the God who created the world and everything in it. The same way our Bible starts. Only then could he progress to speaking of the resurrection of Christ and eventual judgment. The sermon on Mars Hill in Athens is set forth in Acts 17, commencing at verse 22. For those wishing to look into the nature, character and attributes of God, I suggest starting with Pastor Jeff's five-part series on the nature of God, the first message of which was delivered on the 11th of September 2016 and which had been uploaded to the church's website, our YouTube site. 
Suffice it to say, God exists. He is holy, omnipotent, unlimited in ability. He is omniscient, knows all things. He is a God of life, of light, of love. And we could continue on and on. It is interesting, though, that when God chose to reveal something of the third heaven to men, the aspect that he always stressed is his holiness. We see this in Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 4, when Isaiah the prophet was shown the th- envision the third heaven and he heard the angels cry out holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory when the apostle John was given a revelation of the third heaven and it's set forth in Revelation 4 he also heard the four living creatures crying out day and night, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And then in Revelation 15, verse 4, we read, Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. And we have the warning from Revelation 10, 1 to 3. That's Revelation 10, verses 1 to 3. Then Nahab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put the incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. These were priests who were authorized to burn incense before the Lord, but only according to the manner that the Lord had provided. And then in verse 2, so fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near to me I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people I must be glorified. God is a holy God. He cannot, he will not ignore sin. It would be contrary to his very nature. Instead, he has established a way of righteously forgiving sin by paying the penalty for himself. He is indeed just and righteously justifies sinners as set forth in Romans 3.26. At this point, I want to briefly introduce God's ultimate intention for those who will receive him. And when I saw this, it came to me as a great shock. It's not something that had ever been expressed to me in scriptural terms. The Apostle Peter set forth his summary of God's purpose for believers in 2 Peter 1.4. And I would like everyone who has a Bible to look at this. And those who don't already know it may get the same surprise I did myself. 2 Peter 1.4. 
I'm going to read down to it from verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 3.18, stated that we, and I'll, I'll actually, I'll read it out, 2 Peter 3, verse, starting with verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now if we turn back to Genesis 1, 26 and 27, we find that mankind was originally created in God's image. Genesis 1, 26 to 27. And God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. As had been foreknown by God, mankind fell and corrupted that image. Nevertheless, God's original purpose for mankind will not be thwarted. He will have a people in his own image and they will populate the new Jerusalem for eternity. God's original purpose for man will be achieved. And we have the comfort of Romans 8, verses 28 to 30. And we know that all things work together for good for, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he, he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. One of the primary, primary objectives of this study is to establish from Scripture that salvation is not found in a confession of words nor in conformity to a prescribed code of conduct or dress, not even in mental assent to a code of belief. Salvation is to be found in a person wholly human and wholly divine, the second person of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus Christ. Moreover, no human being can be saved without the active involvement of the Godhead and salvation can only be received in the manner provided by God. We cannot earn it or deserve it, we have to come to God his way. 
John 5, 39 to 40. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. That was said to the Bible believers of the day, men who studied the scriptures diligently, earnestly, who taught them. And then in Acts 4.12, it said, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And that's repeated. I've got a list of scriptures here where it's repeated. As we will establish, salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit resulting from believing in one's heart that the Lord Jesus died for one's sins, was buried and rose again, and trusting him for one's salvation. We must believe certain things and we must trust. Since the fall, salvation has always been by grace through faith. But the content of what must be believed has varied with each dispensation. We won't look at that today. But what Abraham had to believe to be justified was quite different to what we must believe to be justified. As I've previously stated, the Bible is very clear that mankind is inherently sinful. Everyone will one day stand before an infinitely holy God to give account for their deeds in the body before either the beamer seat or the great white throne. The required standard to escape eternity in the lake of fire is absolute holiness. Romans 4, 12 points out that we will each of us give a give account of himself to God. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, commencing in verse 6. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. In Isaiah 39, it is said, Behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel and with both wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate and he will destroy its sinners from it. This is not to preach a gospel of works. Salvation is by grace through faith. But mankind faces the age-old dilemma. How can a human being face the righteous judgment of God? How can we stand before him and be accounted absolutely righteous and holy? In Psalm 14, in 143, it said in verse 2, Do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no one living is righteous. In the book of Job, twice they ask the question, 
How can a man be righteous before God or how can he be pure who is born of a woman? Adam Clark in his commentary on Job 14.4 says, The text refers to man's original and corrupt nature. Every man that is born into the world comes into it in a corrupt or sinful state. This is called original sin and is derived from fallen Adam who is the stock to the utmost ramification of the, holy fa- of the human family. Not one human spirit is born into the world without this corruption of nature. All are impure and unholy, and from this principle of depravity all transgression is produced. And from this corruption of nature, God alone can save. Human beings sin because they are by nature sinners. But God has provided the provision to answer this. God is holy. But he, in his wisdom, graciously provided a just way to enable him to forgive sin by paying for sin himself. As we shall see, the answer to mankind's need is through acceptance of propitiatory sacrifice, the sacrifice of appeasement of the Lord Jesus and being found in him, having his righteousness imputed to us. Expressed another way, we are to be found on the day of judgment clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Colossians 1, 21 to 23. And you who were once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Ephesians 1, 4 says just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. And in Ephesians 5, 27, 26 and 27, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her, with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and without blemish. In the KJV New Testament, the phrase in Christ appears in 76 verses. The phrase in him in relation to Christ, appears in 46 verses. The phrase in Jesus appears in seven verses and the phrase in whom, in relation to Christ, appears in 14 verses. Now we have been told that if it's in scripture, it's important. If it appears in two scriptures, it's very important. And we have this form of reference to union with Christ appearing in over 140 verses of the KJV New Testament. There is also related teaching on subjects such as abiding in a vine and abiding in the word. I ask you, how important does something have to be for God to devote so much of his word to it? Salvation involves, in essence, being brought into and kept in relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that is, abiding in him. He is indeed the way, the truth, 
and the life. This reality is stressed many times in Scripture. As I've said, God's required standard for salvation is holiness, absolute righteousness of thought, word and action. Only the Lord Jesus meets that standard and hence it is only in Christ that we can stand in the final judgment and escape the eternal damnation that we deserve. Those who believe on Jesus as the divine Messiah, the Christ of God, having believed the gospel and being born from above, may die physically, but that they will never again experience spiritual death. They will live eternally in the new Jerusalem. As we look to conclude, please turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. One Thessalonians four thirteen to eighteen. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him in those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. The souls of every human being will one day leave their physical bodies. They will either be called out of their bodies by the Lord Jesus or forced out by their bodies becoming unfit for further use through sickness, decay or physical violence. God has informed us in Hebrews 9, 27 that it is appointed for men to die once but after this the judgment. Having thus left our bodies, we will subsequently be, go before either the judgment seat of Christ, sometimes called the Bema seat, or the great white throne. The former will be for those in Christ where they will receive their rewards for the things done during their physical lifetimes. The second will be for those not in Christ who will be sentenced to eternity in the lake of fire. Should anyone wish to learn more concerning these judgments, they could consider watching the two messages delivered by the late Pastor Iron Morgan on the 28th of November 2010. The first was entitled The Judgment Seat of Christ, the second The Great White Throne Judgment. The absolutely crucial, indeed paramount consideration for every human being is to ensure that upon leaving their bodies, they will be found in Christ, not having their own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Let's read this in Philippians 3, 8 and 9. 
Philippians 3, 8 and 9. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is from the law but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith. There is nothing more important in this life than to avail yourself of God's offer of salvation. We are exhorted in Scripture to test ourselves, one example being by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 13 5. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? I want to conclude this message with the record of the Apostle John in his Apostle, chapter 20, verses 28 to 31, where he states his purpose in writing his gospel. John, chapter 20, verses 28 to 31. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name.